Let us go to the Lord in prayer. God, we come to you this day, pleading the blood of Jesus over everyone assembled, that they may hear what the Spirit says to them. Now let the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Today, in the church calendar, we celebrate what is termed the Reign of Christ Sunday, or another term that you may be familiar with is called Christ the King Sunday. And um, my uh, original message has changed um, over the course of the last couple of days because of what's been happening in the world, but it all seems to fit in to what God is saying to us through God's word. First, I want to begin with telling you a little bit about the significance of Christ the King Sunday or the reign of Christ Sunday, in that we as United Methodists and some other Christian denominations follow what is called a lectionary. A lectionary is the set readings for a given week that cover a period of three years. We have the years divided into A, B, and C. Today marks the last day of the lectionary calendar and we are currently in year B. So next Sunday, we will start a new lectionary year and we'll be in year C. Well, you may think, well, what does that got to do with anything? It has a lot to do with how we uh, study, how we uh, preach, how we pray, because the lectionary was adopted from the practice of the Jewish synagogue of keeping certain scriptures preached on certain Sabbaths. And when the rabbis or teachers would teach the people, they had typically something from the Psalms, something from the Torah, something from the prophets, and we likewise follow that pattern because we call it the Old Testament <laughs> readings and which is the, the Jewish uh, scriptures. And we also incorporate now as Christians what we call our New Testament texts. And we derive our structure of preaching and teaching from the lectionary calendar. And this being, uh, Christ the King Sunday is somewhat significant historically because this particular Sunday was designated in 1925 um, by Pope Pius IX. And uh, we, like many other Christian uh, religious um, organizations, follow a structured way of preaching. And because during this particular time in history, the governments around the world, because it was at the end of World War II, many governments had collapsed. The uh, importance of focusing on that there's a government of God was emphasized, that there is a kingdom, there is a government, there is a structure that will not collapse and will not fail, and it is the government of God. So consequently, we have Christ the King Sunday or the reign of Christ Sunday. And this day I share with you uh, the scripture that um, is slated for this particular Sunday, which is John 18 verses 33 through 37. But I also remind us that in um, 1 Timothy, not, yes, 1 Timothy 4 and 13, 
there was a scripture that says, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to preaching and teaching, meaning that as we await Jesus's return, we are still to devote ourselves to reading, to scripture, to preaching and to teaching, and consequently learning. So as our understanding evolve, evolves with the um, focus on John 18, we see, which has already been read for your hearing, the scripture from the New Revised Standard Version, then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? What's happening here is that the Sanhedrin, the, the high council of the Jewish um, establishment has brought Jesus to Pilate to put him on trial. Actually, the Sanhedrin have already put Jesus on trial themselves, but they don't have power to execute him. So they have handed Jesus off to Pilate with the hope and the intent that Pilate will convict Jesus and execute him. So he, so Pilate asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answers, do you ask this on your own or did others tell you about me? In other, other words, uh, is this a charge you're bringing to me or is this something that you have been told? And um, so Pilate recognizes that um, something is amiss here because uh, he says, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? So Pilate is looking for some evidence for purposes of saying that Jesus is guilty of something. And Jesus answers him and says, my kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. So Pilate asked him, so you are a king. <laughs> and Jesus says, you say that I am a king. For this, I was born. And for this, I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. In this simple exchange, Pilate is recognizing and affirming and acknowledging that Jesus is the king. And I think his measure of relief comes when Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. In other words, Pilate is thinking, okay, he's got a kingdom, but I don't have to worry about him trying to come in and take over where I'm in charge. So Pilate, while he's interested in what the Jews have to say, because this council is part of his political arm that has helped him to keep rule over the Jewish people, and Pilate is a Roman in this kingdom. He wants his kingdom to be intact, yet his diplomacy and his connection with his Jewish Sanhedrin is going to allow him to still have clout with them. And as he is in conversation with Jesus, Jesus, remember, is also on trial. And even though in this particular passage of the scripture of John, we are not going as far as to see that Jesus ultimately is crucified, which we already know the end of the story because we've seen this movie before. But in his interrogation or his cross-examination of Jesus on the stand, he can find nothing really which satisfies the requirement to say that Jesus is guilty, therefore he must be put to death. So Jesus is on trial. Jesus is being assessed for his innocence and for his guilt according to the charge. And the charge is you are claiming to be king. Jesus himself is not making the claim, but the Jews, the Jews lay the claim at the doorstep and at the feet of Jesus. And even if you know the story well, when Jesus is ultimately crucified, 
Pilate has written above his head in every known language of that day that Jesus is king. So the declaration and the coronation of Jesus is publicly displayed in the midst of the crucifixion, which is ironic in and of itself. And I bring this up particularly today because it's poignant because a couple of things are happening in our own society in terms of courtroom examination, courtroom outcomes, and courtroom uh, decisions. So uh, I want to mention two in particular. Uh, there was a young man named Kyle Rittenhouse who recently was put on trial for, um, for some uh, killings that went on in Kenosha, at a little town called Kenosha. So when uh, most people would know what I'm talking about, 80% of the people that they hear Kyle Rittenhouse, if they hear Kenosha, if they hear um, Black Lives Matters, they would know what I'm talking about. But I just wanna generally set this to one side. People are either on one side of the issue or they are on another side of the issue in terms of how they thought the outcome of the case should have happened. And people are justified in feeling what they want to feel and how they want to feel because they have a right to have an opinion on the matter. But when we look at the American justice system, we find that it's not simply a matter of justice that really pans out. Just as we look at Jesus's situation, and it's not always a matter of justice that really pans out. It's a matter of courtroom procedures. It's a matter of politics. It's a matter of public opinion. And sometimes the groundswell of public opinion Sometimes the groundswell of passion influences people to go in one direction or the other. Now, there's another case that's been in the news that you may not have paid particular attention to. And, but I noted it. I noted it <laughs> because there was a man back in the 60s named Malcolm X. Some of you may know who he is. Some of you may know the name, but really don't know anything more about him. Malcolm X was assassinated. After Malcolm X was assassinated, there were two men who were convicted for the assassination of Malcolm X. And their names were Muhammad Aziz and Khalil Islam. And I'm saying this for your hearing. After all these years and all these decades, since 1965, when Malcolm was assassinated until this week in history, the investigation after both these men had been convicted for a crime has revealed these men really didn't do it. Not a lot of people are paying attention to that, but you should. Because I want to point back to the fact that the justice system is not always just. Just because someone is pronounced not guilty does not mean that the person didn't do it. Just because someone is pronounced guilty doesn't mean that the person did it because the pronouncement of guilt or innocence is not always in alignment with what the truth is. So when Jesus says, I came to testify to the truth, that's saying something because in the end, Jesus knows that the truth will win out. Let us consider Jesus was falsely accused. Jesus was politically persecuted. Jesus was wrongly convicted. And Jesus was publicly humiliated. And yet and still, he took upon him the humiliation, the suffering, not because he was guilty of committing any crime, but he went on the cross 
as the substitutionary work for us all. I want you to understand that at some point in each of our lives, we all deserve to be described as guilty of something, but Jesus in his kingdom, in his system of justice, in God's kingdom, in God's system of justice is prepared to take on the guilt of everyone who would confess their sin and give their lives over to Christ because Christ has paid the penalty for you that you do not have to suffer the consequences in the kingdom that is to come. All those whose sins are confessed and are forgiven are proclaimed not guilty. Why? Because you are covered by the blood of Jesus. It's as if I had uh, a list of my sins, correct? And I have all my sins listed. I don't know if you can see it. All my sins listed on this piece of paper. But when the blood of Jesus covers it, guess what? When it's covered by the blood, there's nothing to be seen. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? In God's kingdom, in Christ's reign, it does not matter what you've done to whom you've done it, how long ago it happened, how recently it's happened, if it's still going on. But if you are willing to confess your sin, acknowledge that you are a sinner, God is more than willing and more than able to forgive your sin and wipe your record clean. This is the gift of God. This is salvation. This is why Jesus went to the cross so that everyone who is guilty can be set free. Will you receive him as your Lord and Savior today? If you have not gone to him in prayer, if you have not gone to him in all sincerity, if you have not confessed your sins, Say this simple prayer after me, where you are. Lord Jesus, I believe you are the son of God. I believe you died on the cross to take away my sin. I confess that I'm a sinner. I repent of my sin. Come into my heart, be the Lord and savior of my life. Thank you for saving me. If you believe what you just prayed, say amen. Amen and amen.